Good afternoon, everyone. Please rise as members of the Brown University Chorus sing the national anthem. And please remain standing afterwards for the invocation by the university chaplain, Reverend Janet Cooper Nelson. Bernonians all, in this moment of celebration, will remain standing. We are bold in this moment to ask blessing on these stars of Brown's rising generation, newly illumined by the light of research, friendship, and even wisdom, these bright lives entrusted to us for a season are about to set forth, seeking to dispatch the ancient goals of this university, that is to dispatch the offices of life with usefulness and reputation, with compassion and nuanced thought. We are grateful for their season on College Hill. This great university's blessings of faculty resources, and benefactors called together in this place find their purpose in students. We remember the families and schools and teachers from communities far and wide across the globe who entrusted to us these, our students, our beloved students, who have loved and supported them before we ever knew them and sent them to us to become scholars. The skies of the world always challenge. They offer clouds. They ask of us a vision that is beyond bigotry and cruelty. They ask that our usefulness and our reputation be so much more than about our little lives and be instead about grand human purpose. So we ask for these who stand, that they may find their life's calling in service to real amelioration of human wrong, and may find their vision in purposes to imagine ways of doing science, innovation, compassion, never yet seen. Bless us all in this moment of completion and beginning. May the bright cord of friendship that has long been woven here now be strong to hold us close, as as the family of Brown, we may be ever true to serve what is good, what is excellent, what is worthy of life's blessing, and may be a blessing in the life of the world you love, always and ever. Amen. Now you can be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rashid Zia, and I serve as Dean of the College. As a Brown alumnus, it's my pleasure to welcome you, the class of 
For, 20, for 29 years, the college has convened this mid-year completion ceremony to celebrate the achievements of students like you, students who are fortunate enough to be members of not one, but two classes, students who have charted their own path through Brown. Whether you arrived as a mid-year transfer, took advantage of a leave away from campus, or pursued opportunities to continue your studies here a bit longer, you will soon be completing your time on campus with us. This ceremony is not meant to replace graduation. Many of you already walked through the Van Wickle gates last year, and you are all welcome to walk through those gates this upcoming May when your official degrees will be conferred. And every May thereafter, as part of commencement, that larger celebration of the Brown community. Today, though, is a moment just for you and your loved ones, your family and friends, your teachers and classmates. So class of 2018.5, please join me in a hearty round of applause to thank everyone who has come here, either in person or watching from afar, to join in celebrating you. Today is an auspicious day, December 1st, the first day of the last month of the Julian calendar. At times like these, I like to think about how time helps set the stage for certain events. Growing up, I remember being confused about years, especially New Year's. See, I'm an immigrant. I was born in Iran, but moved to America as a small child. In America, New Year's seems so clear and certain. The new year was marked by the stroke of midnight on January 1st. You stayed up late, you watched TV, the ball dropped, and the year was new. But in Iran, where I was born, New Year's, or Noruz as it's called, literally the new day, is a little bit more complicated. It actually happens on a different day, at a different hour, minute, and second every year. Last year, it was March 20th at 12.15 p.m. in the afternoon. In 2020, it will be March 19th at 11.50 p.m. As a kid, you can imagine how this was a bit confusing. It was only later, actually when I came to Brown, that I learned Noruz was set by a precise cosmic moment, the moment of the spring equinox, when the sun passes through the plane of the equator and when night and day are equal. And it was through the friendships made at Brown that I learned years are defined not by clocks, but by shared traditions. I am lucky enough to have added many yearly traditions to my life, from January 1st and Noruz to Chinese New Year's and Rosh Hashanah, from convocation and commencement to this mid-year completion ceremony. What this has taught me is not only is life more interesting and complete with many calendars, but also that we are more complete too as individuals and as a community. In some communities, rules and structures define a very precise order. A comes before B, B comes before C, and so on. In other communities, though, order is defined by choice, purpose, and shared values. As you know well, the Brown undergraduate experience is the latter. Our curriculum is defined by choice and purpose. Indeed, it was almost 50 years ago that faculty met next door in Sales Hall, where we'll soon celebrate and voted to the raucous celebration of students sitting on the main green to launch the curriculum by ratifying a new philosophy for education at Brown. That philosophy said that the purpose of education, undergraduate education at Brown, is the intellectual and personal growth of individual students. That students ultimately responsible for their development must be active participants in framing their own education, and that everything else, the structures, rules, regulations, should follow from that purpose. Indeed, the faculty rules explicitly require us to provide exceptional students like you with, quote, the maximum opportunity to formulate and achieve your educational objectives, and on your own time. What some of you know is that these words in the faculty rules came from students. In fact, it was 70 students much like yourselves today who helped break the mold at Brown. As part of the university's first GISP or group independent study, they reflected on their own education 
And perhaps unlike you, they wrote a 400-page report about it. <laughs> but they wrote that undergraduate education should create an environment in which students are encouraged to formulate and consider problems which are most basic to them, what their lives are about, why they seek the goals they do, where they want to go, and what they want to do. As point fivers, I know that you understand and appreciate these words even more than most Brown students. And that is why we are gathered here today, to celebrate your education and the important role that you have played in the education of your classmates and this university. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker and the champion of our community, the 19th president of Brown University, Christina Paxson. Thank you very much, Dean Zia, and welcome, everybody. I am always so excited to come to this mid-year completion ceremony as we recognize our mid-year graduates this year, the very great class of 18.5. So to the family members and friends who are here, just thanks for joining us today. I know that your support for our students means the world to them and will continue to mean the world to them throughout their lives, so, so thanks for being here. The theme of my brief remarks here today is change. And whether it's been 4.5 years since you started at Brown, or more or less, a lot of variation, the world has changed in numerous ways, both large and small. So let me start with words. When you began at Brown, the words biohacking, hangry, fintech, and mansplain were not in the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> now they are. There have been advances in technology. When you arrived, agricultural drones and brain mapping and genome editing were among the year's, quote, breakthrough technologies. OK, they're still consequential, but they're old news. They've given way to this year 3D metal printing, zero carbon natural gas, and cloud-based AI. So a lot's happened. And Brown has evolved, too. Now, for those of you who started in September 2014, how many of you? OK, a lot of you. I'm not going to give you a quiz, but in the farthest reaches of your memory, you may or may not recall fragments of my convocation remarks. <laughs> and at that time, I spoke about how Brown has changed over its 250-year history. I noted the evolution of the open curriculum, now 50 years old, and also changes in the Brown community, which have become ever more diverse, representing the best and brightest students from around the country, from all walks of life, from around the world. It's fabulous. I believe that these changes taken together are really important because they make a Brown education more relevant today than it has ever, ever been. Because the world needs people who can navigate complexity, who can work collaboratively across cultural divides, and who learn throughout their lives at a pace that keeps up with technological change. And these people are all of you. That's who you are. And, and the world does need you. Now, one of the things that I find most remarkable is how much of the change at Brown that's occurred over the years has been driven by our students. And Dean Zia noted one example, the open curriculum, which emerged out of a group independent study project involving 70 students. That's a pretty big group independent study project. And the goal then was to enhance intellectual freedom at Brown and enable students to be the architects of their own education. And the project grew into a movement. And then three years later, as we heard, this student-centered approach to education was adopted and called what was then the new curriculum. We don't call it that now. Another example, and we have a really important anniversary coming up in just a few days. This is the Black Student Walkout of 1968 which we honored on its 50th anniversary. Well, in, we honored earlier this, this semester 
uh, with, with black alumni who came to campus from all over the country and the world. And that walkout prompted major advances in diversity at Brown, increasing the numbers of students and faculty and administrators from previously underrepresented groups, and really expanding the range of voices that we hear on student uh, on campus, and making, I think, a Brown education just more valuable for every single member of our community. More recently, students have continued to make Brown better, advocating for more robust peer mentoring programs, creating the Ivy League's first and only first-generation low-income student center, and contributing powerfully to the diversity and inclusion action plan that we introduced in 2016. So we have a lot to thank our students for. And soon to be, as, as you, who are all soon to be Brown alumni, you're cut from this cloth. You've learned from these experiences. Many of you have taken part in them. And you're part already of an extraordinary legacy of active, empowered Brown students. So as you leave Brown, I encourage you to take this notion forward, to carry it forward past the gates of the university, the idea that you can and should drive positive change. Take this idea to heart and keep it with you. This means being engaged in every way possible. Wherever you go, build community. Deploy knowledge to solve problems. Elevate the public good. Be champions of things. Bring out the best in others. And as I hope all of you did very recently, vote every election cycle. Please, do it. Now, all of these things help us model the practice of being part of something larger than ourselves. And that's really important because it's precisely what the world needs right now. Because another change during your time at Brown is that this country and many other countries around the world have become more divided and more polarized, sometimes abruptly, sometimes gradually. And this is hampering our ability to confront really serious issues like inequality, like climate change, like threats to democracy. Now, even at this early stage in your lives, I know that you're already on a path to be change makers, and you've found your own spaces in the universe of civic and global engagement. Let me just give a few examples, and I don't mean to pull these out as the best, they're just a few that represent the group that's graduating here today. Among the 18.5ers are, a Royce Fellow who conducted an ethnographic study of a community in Honduras that hosts medical volunteers twice a year. And this work added to an understanding of global health and humanitarian response. A Watson Institute student who took time off from Brown to work with displaced Syrians at a refugee camp in Greece. And with a policy institute in Lebanon seeking to understand the political dimensions of the refugee crisis in the Middle East. A Voss Fellow at the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society who studied plant growth and nitrogen fixation in tropical ecosystems, gaining insight into reforestation efforts in the Brazilian Amazon. Critically important, critically important to understand this to help mitigate climate change. And a recently announced Rhodes Scholarship winner who's engaged scholarship in archaeology, Middle East geopolitics, and Islamic art has it connected her deeply to cultural and social justice issues in the region. OK, let's congratulate Rhea Stark for that. Is she here? Yeah. OK. Now, again, I call out these examples. All of you have accomplished so much at your time at Brown. You've launched startups, and you've contributed to research, and you've partnered with community organizations, and you've built a strong network of community here, friends who will stay with you your entire lives, and that's terrific. So now, as you leave College Hill and segue into a changing world that needs you more than ever, you're more than well prepared. You really are, I'm confident in that. And you leave as thinkers and builders and innovators and compassionate citizens with a keen sense of responsibility 
to make life better for others. So today, let me just conclude by saying that I couldn't be prouder of all of you for completing your degree requirements on your own terms and in your own time. I offer you my very best wishes for a lifetime of fulfillment and joy. Be your iconoclastic selves, go on and do iconoclastic things, and all of us at Brown will be cheering you on always. So congratulations, 18.5ers. Thank you. Thank you, President Paxson. Um, as advocated by students 50 years ago pushing for change, a central aspect of the open curriculum is the relationship of students with professors and with fellow students and the material they approach together. It has been university tradition since our very first class, more than 250 years ago, to hear from students completing their time here. Today, we will hear from two of your classmates. It is my pleasure to introduce our first student speaker, Alexandria Pimentel. <laughs> Alexandria is a native Rhode Islander who spent six years in the United States Navy where she served as a cryptologic technician and was awarded the Joint Service Achievement Medal. Alexandria is a member of the resumed undergraduate education program, a small, highly selective program for students who have interrupted or delayed their formal education. She joined Brown after completing her associate's degree in mechanical engineering technology from the New England Institute of Technology. And this month will be completing dual concentrations in geological sciences and visual arts. Some of you might also recognize her as your kickboxing instructor at the Nelson Fitness Center. She's a member of the Civil Air Patrol teaching cadets aerospace education and serves as an air, on an air crew as an aerial photographer. Please join me in welcoming Alexandria to speak. Thank you. Um, all right, so um, in 2006, I graduated high school a high school that was geographically located um, only about 15 miles north of here. But little did I know then that my journey to Brown was still thousands of miles away. After over a decade of detours, setbacks, and meandering paths traveled, I finally found myself here. Today, most of us are here with our families and loved ones celebrating this important milestone in our lives. And overall, we feel accomplished and happy. Maybe some of us are nervous about what is yet to come or where we will best fit in the world. Do not worry, you are ready. Whichever path you choose is the right path because it is the path that makes the most sense for the time. And it is the path that will lead you to find a deeper meaning in life. In Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, he discusses the difference between people who seek to live happy lives and those who seek to live meaningful lives. He says, happy people live in the present. Those who live meaningful lives have a narrative for the past and a plan for the future. Based on what I've observed from all of you here at Brown, I think it is safe to say that most of us are choosing to seek out a life of meaning. Right now, I know it may feel like whichever path you choose next will determine the rest of your life's trajectory, but I'm here to assure you that sometimes your path in life is meant to be discovered not necessarily decided. As a non-traditional resumed undergraduate education student, I am honored to have the opportunity to speak with you all today. My path after high school did not lead me straight to college, but it did still lead me to seek out a life of meaning. It allowed me to learn through experiences and value the importance of both professional and personal growth. My opening statement in my application to Brown said, I come from a family that many would consider destined for failure. At the time, this was a point that I had spent so much of my life trying to disprove. But the truth is, I have failed many times. But I use each failure as a navigational tool to reorient my path back to success. Ultimately, failure is what tells us to change directions or try another way. So if you have a clear goal in life, never quit but do know when to change directions. 
There are many days of failure ahead of all of us. Do not let that alarm you, because those are going to be the days that we are going to lead us to our path through success. If hard work and persistence does not reap reward, then it is time to change directions or pave a completely new path. In these moments, in these moments it may seem devastating, but this is when you will dig deep. It is not when we are at the top and everything is going great that we learn our true grit. It is when we are at our lowest and quitting seems easier than continuing on that we find a way to reorient ourselves back to the path of success. In my senior year of high school, a good friend of mine and I began planning for college. We were two young girls that were so excited to be roommates at UMass Amherst. We were both so excited to start this new chapter together. We talked about matching sweatshirts and the best place to find good food on campus. But when my decision letter came in the mail, I was not accepted to UMass Amherst or even my state college, URI. Those were the only two colleges that I applied to at the time. My classroom grades were good, but I did not do well on my SAT exam. And ultimately, I was rejected from both colleges. I remember feeling demoralized at the time, not knowing what to do next. But some circumstances are beyond our control. Eager to make a better life for myself and stay out of debt, I enlisted into the United States Navy. My time in the military taught me so many great lessons. The most important lesson for all of your futures is understanding the value of great leadership and seeing how poor leadership can greatly strain a mission and its people. The best leaders constantly mentor the next generation and encourage them to keep growing. They lead their teams with honor, integrity, honesty, and excellence. To lead with honor is to have the utmost respect for yourself. Exercise your mind, exercise your body, and exercise your soul. And to have the utmost respect for what you represent, your community, your family, and your culture. To lead with integrity is to always do the right thing for the long term, even when no one else is looking. See problems and solutions all the way through before taking action. Respect yourself and know your value. To lead with honesty is to hold yourself accountable for your thoughts, behaviors, and actions. Be forthcoming about your mistakes and admit fault. It will earn you respect and it is the highest credential one can achieve, as honesty is the only avenue for peace of mind. And lead with excellence. It's to take pride in your name and the team that you represent. Strive to do your best at whatever it is you're investing your time in doing. But also take the time to grow your people and your team. They will become your most valuable asset in both the short term and the long. If you develop a passion for hard work and excellence, then you will be free to explore all of your interests in life. I was lucky enough to have an excellent leader during my last tour in the Navy. Her leadership was so great that I planned on separating from the military and continuing to work on her team just as a civilian. This was going to be my new life trajectory. I was prepared to commit my future to being a career analyst. It was a great plan. But once again, failure came to guide me another way. The government was going through sequestration and there was a nationwide government hiring freeze. It could take months to over a year before I could continue on with the government hiring process. I remember this was a really, really scary time. There was no going back to my parents, and there was no going back to the military. Unsure of what I was going to do next and where I would find the most meaning in life, I enrolled in college at the New England Institute of Technology. NEIT had an open enrollment with a mechanical engineering program that later became my motivation for applying to Brown. While at NEIT, I started to focus my efforts on gaining the skills necessary to effectively contribute to the human space exploration mission. I had done research on one of the newly selected NASA astronauts from 2013, Jessica Meir, who is a Brown alum. 
<laughs> I became more motivated than ever to embark on a similar journey and set my sights on Brown University. By the fall of 2015, I started my first semester here at Brown. It was going to be amazing. I just knew it. Maybe some of you remember having similar thoughts. I started engineering classes and became immersed in my studies. Things were going OK in the beginning, but then things steadily began to feel unstable around midterms and then finals. I was not doing well on my exams. And this was the largest part of our grade. It was devastating. I became so concerned that I actually saw a doctor to assess if there was something wrong with me. I was fine and my IQ was high, but I just had a different way of thinking. Reflecting on this moment, I learned to validate myself and my own growing knowledge. Sometimes things don't go as planned, but I needed to be patient and respect the time and hard work that I invested in gaining other skills, such as research and analytics. But once again, failure reoriented my path. I changed my concentration to geological science and visual art. This is when I started to look forward to doing homeworks, where I could read, analyze, and write academic papers discussing planetary science. It was amazing. This new path also increased the amount of time that I was able to spend with leaders and experts in the field. The Planetary Science Friday research meetings became my favorite aspect of Brown. I could sit in the back of a room on a Friday evening while observing and listening to renowned experts discuss engaging space-related topics every week. I no longer needed theoretical engineering. I was still at Brown, and now I could spend the majority of my days thinking about the moon and Mars Oh, while creating visual art. It felt like a dream. Looking back now, I cannot imagine what my life would have been like had even one of those things gone differently. So I encourage you all to embrace your journey and relax. Let failure guide you and live to be incredible where others do not have the power to validate you. You know who you are, and if you conduct yourself in good character and stay focused on your mission, then you will have freed yourself to explore all of your interests in life with confidence and usefulness. Because to live a meaningful life does not mean to live a perfect life without mistakes, setbacks, or detours, but is to learn from those mistakes and grow over your obstacles while blocking out the naysayers. You all are exceptionally talented and motivated and will absolutely do amazing things in your lives. There's no doubt about it. Sometimes we may not get the credit and recognition we feel we deserve, but our contribution still may very well influence the world. In these moments, it is important to reflect on your character and on your contribution and have that be enough to make you proud. We are graduating from Brown University and with that comes the expectation that we are highly competent and that we value personal growth. As we all go on to do great things and become our world's future leaders, look to lead with honor, integrity, honesty, and excellence. It is through these experiences that I have found deeper meaning and happiness in my life. It is my hope that in sharing my journey with you today that you all can get a head start at learning how to use failure as a tool for navigation, learn to validate yourselves by being confident with your own growing knowledge, and take the time to develop a great character along with your great professions. Thank you all so much for your time, and I cannot wait to see who you all are about to become. Congratulations, class of 2018.5. Thank you, Alexandria. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Atea Douglas. <laughs> Atea is an education studies concentrator from Clinton, New Jersey. While at Brown, she has worked as an engaged scholar with nonprofit organizations like Breakthrough Collaborative and the Highlander Institute, 
as a literature teacher and a consultant working to spread culturally responsive instruction in Providence Public Schools. She currently coordinates a program that provides college readiness support and research experience to young women of color who are alumni of Sophia Academy in Providence. In addition to studying education, Atea also studied Arabic throughout her time at Brown, her sixth language, and traveled to Oman this past summer as a critical language scholar. Outside of the classroom, Atea danced with the Fusion and Impulse Dance Companies. <laughs> she was recently named a Rose Scholarship finalist and will be pursuing graduate studies in social policy and second language ed education acquisition. Please join me in welcoming Atea to speak. Thank you so much, Dean Zia. When the time came to make the decision about where I would go to college, I was poring over two options, Brown University and Duke University. To make the final choice, I relied on a bizarre moment of divine intervention that at the time felt very real to me. In those moments of decision making, I had a vision of the woman that I would become once I graduated from each institution. They were both a few inches taller <laughs> and were smiling very clearly back at me. The woman from Duke was decked out in blue from head to toe. She wore her sorority letters very proudly and her graduation cap sat atop of expertly pressed straight black tresses that no one was allowed to touch. She posed a little something like this. She was a diva, she was a diva. <laughs> the woman from Brown was smiling from ear to ear, wore the colors of kente cloth around her neck as a reminder of her roots, and her graduation cap struggled against the buoyancy of her very curly afro as she proudly threw a power fist into the air. She posed a little something like this. Now maybe she was a little bit corny, but something about her seemed real, genuine, perhaps ever true. And so I eagerly cast my vote for the corny but lovable brown activist, and I expected to enjoy the four years of blissful smooth sailing that stood between me and her. However, as all of us who are graduates in the room know, for very unique and different reasons, life did not go as planned. In the spring of my sophomore year, I had to pause. I left Brown for a year and a half on a medical leave. I felt withered and was barely able to whisper the words, me too. I used to harbor a lot of embarrassment for a decision I felt I had no other choice but to make. I did not feel brave, but weak. When people asked me what I did with my time off, I struggled to admit that I was home, distant from my family, sleeping from the fatigue of therapy and depression. And even as I started back on my road to completing Brown, it often felt like I was convincing myself to do a sprint up the highest mountain. And as in the worst of our dreams, no matter how hard I ran, the peak seemed unattainable. So to be here tonight in this moment with all of you makes me feel almost immortal. <laughs> and <laughs> Thank you. And for all the diversity of our experiences, I want to celebrate what, for many of us point fivers in the room, is the audacity to return. The audacity to reclaim our college experiences and ultimately our power. 
We have persevered in rewriting the traditional college path. The path that looks like becoming best friends with your roommate freshman year and riding off into the sunset together. <laughs> Then, sophomore year, landing that amazing internship and polishing your LinkedIn to perfection. Junior year finds you studying abroad in Valencia, Spain, when everyone else is here at Brown in the cold. And finally, senior year, it all ends with you sobbing at Friday at the Ratty with your best friends as you eat your last chicken finger for hopefully a very long time. <laughs> Perhaps we have been able to write our counter narratives because we are a community of students that is committed to giving voice to the stories that lay at the periphery. We have used the language our courses have given us to articulate our experiences with marginalization, acknowledging that dominant narratives are often incomplete. We tread our campus grounds with the knowledge that it sits on indigenous land and was built by enslaved labor centering the histories of social injustice that are intimately tied to institutions of higher education. We have created transparency around mental health, empowering our peers to recover their peace. In her speech celebrating the renaming of Paige Robinson Hall after Brown's first black graduates, President Paxson remarked that whether through symbolic action or tangible action, Brown is committed to renegotiating its power in order to do good. It often treads that path alone, leading the way for other institutions to follow suit. That legacy of righteousness and fearless independence lives within all of us. So I invite you all to sit in a posture of reclamation, proud of the ways in which you are all reclaiming what it means to have a quintessential college experience. For in what makes us point fibers, whether that meant pursuing other forms of education, leaving Brown but remaining in Providence, taking care of our health, grieving, taking care of our families, or even graduating early, it is in our audacity to reclaim the narrative of what it means to be a college student, which necessitates celebrating our power. Now today may not mean that we feel or have always felt strong, or that we are not still wading in the waters of our vulnerability. It simply means that as we faced having chosen or not chosen to deviate from the idea of what college should be, ultimately we have finished. And I feel so honored to be in a room with such triumphant and courageous scholars. Part of my philosophy as a student of education is that it is really critical to place the individuality and humanity of students above the research and theories that sometimes generalize who they are and what they bring to the classroom. I refuse to be complicit in that reduction. So the awe that I carry for the dynamism of the students that I've had the privilege to serve and learn from is the same awe I hold as I look out at all of you this evening. When I was a prospective student, I remember being in pure disbelief at the descriptions of brown students who were ballerinas and chemists, or engineers and photographers. But now that I have friends who are selling rap albums and doing shows while in law school at Columbia, <laughs> or who are dancers and cinematographers working around the world, I am quite confident and proud of how multidimensionality is the Brunonia seal. Brown commands us to use all of who we are to talk about the things that matter. To remember that we must take advantage of the full scope of what we have to offer to others and receive from others. I have implored you to celebrate your power, and I want to remind you that the essence of that power is your multidimensionality. As we all leave this juncture in our time at Brown and are off to join the rat race, I pray that we do not sit idle in the face of our power and that we see the open curriculum of our identities as boundless. When I look at myself now, I am in some ways like the woman I thought I would be and in some ways not. I'm still short. <laughs> Unfortunately, I did not grow those few inches taller and I have cut off most of my hair. But now, 
5.5 years later, I'm at the core much more than I ever thought I could be, much more powerful than I could have ever imagined, largely because I was not afraid of time. And I think that's what makes us cool as point fivers. We have seen the malleability of time. We have a very unique understanding of the fruit that comes from not being linear, from not adhering. We do not see time as an enemy. Even though the circumstances around which I became a point fiver were among the most difficult in my life, I have never felt more alive than I do recognizing that I'm living to answer to no one else but myself. And perhaps some of you feel the same. And so I ask that you continue to command time as yours, that you continue to live within your multidimensionality, and that you never forget your power. Congratulations, class of 2018.5! <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank you, Ate. Thank you again. As completing students, you know the mission of Brown, as Reverend Cooper Nelson reminded us, is to serve the community, the nation, and the world by educating and preparing students like you to discharge the offices of life with usefulness and reputation. At Brown, we achieve this mission through a partnership of students and teachers in a unified community known as the University College. Our next speaker is someone who embodies that partnership. As part of a new tradition, we asked you, the class of 2018.5, to nominate faculty members to speak at this celebration. And I am delighted that you recommended our next speaker, Professor Monica Martinez, the Stanley J. Bernstein, Bernstein Assistant Professor of American Studies and Ethnic Studies and Faculty Fellow at the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. Professor Martinez is a Brown alum from the class of 2006 and was a Mellon Mays Fellow. After earning her PhD at Yale University, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Texas at Austin before re returning to join our faculty. At Brown, Professor Martinez teaches courses in Latinx studies, immigration, histories of violence, policing, and public memory in the United States. Her research has been funded by the Mellon Foundation, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, among others. Professor Martinez is the author of a newly released book, The Injustice Never Leaves You, Anti-Mexican Violence in the Texas Borderlands, published by Harvard University Press. And last year, she was selected for the prestigious Carnegie Fellows Program, which provides, quote, the country's most creative thinkers with grants to support research on challenges to democracy and international order. Please join me in welcoming Professor Martinez. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Congratulations, class of 2018.5. I want to thank uh, Dean Zia for the invitation to speak and for the students who uh, submitted my name. I'm so honored to be with you today. And I also just want to ask everyone to give our student speakers another round of applause for those really powerful. <laughs> incredibly powerful statements. I also want to give my thanks to the staff who are helping to coordinate this event, the student volunteers, uh, the catering team, the custodial staff, and everyone helping for the event and the reception to follow. Um, and I also am going to be echoing some of the, the themes that have been brought to the table by our speakers today, and especially amplifying some of the points that President Paxson made. So I'm thrilled to be speaking with you as a member of the Brown faculty, but also as a Brown alum. And from this perspective, I want to say thank you, especially to the families and to the friends that gave support to the students that are graduating. The lessons and guidance that I received from my family allowed me to complete my degree here at Brown. 
and sustain my research and teaching today. So I know how important the contributions and the sacrifices of the families and friends who were here, both families that we were born into and families that we built. Um, so I want to say thank you for supporting the students. As a student preparing to leave Brown, I, uh, excuse me, as students are preparing to leave Brown, I receive a lot of questions about uh, how to move forward with life after Brown, how to start a life, but also how to remain committed to social justice. And so I'm thinking about what it means to graduate in 2018 in this current political climate, which is starkly different from when I graduated from Brown. And so I have three recommendations that I can share with the students who I so moved to see some of your faces. Um, and the first is that I want you to reflect on the passions and commitments that brought you to Brown. The second is that I want you to reflect on the better world that you imagined and demanded in the turbulent years while you were on campus, especially in 2014 and 2015. And the third is that I hope that you'll find inspiration in the new Brown that you helped to make possible, which is certainly a Brown that I could only have dreamed of when I was a student. So to the first point, it takes the guidance of academic mentors to help us all navigate school, but it also takes the wisdom and life lessons of our families, biological and created, and the collective wisdom of our ancestors to help us continue. As an example, I grew up in the small town of South Texas, in viewality of South Texas. It's a rural agrarian town just an hour east of the U.S.-Mexico border. It's close to San Antonio, so I grew up a San Antonio Spurs fan. I also grew up in one of the poorest school districts in the state of Texas. So when I left Texas for Brown, I was thinking very critically about what my new life would be like in Rhode Island, and I was glad to be traveling here with my sister. But I was also still grieving the death of my maternal grandmother, Armandina Munoz. She moved to Texas from Mexico with her husband and their seven children in the 1950s. My mother was the youngest, she was six months old. And when I was growing up, my grandmother took care of me while my parents worked. We called her Mama Grande, or just Mama for short. Near the end of her life, Mama suffered from Alzheimer's. And during the afternoons that I spent with her as a teenager before I left for Brown, we would sit on her couch or on her porch swing, and she would hold my hand, and she told me stories about growing up in Mexico. That summer, in the more advanced stages of her illness, she only repeated three stories. The first was the fantastically romantic story of how she met my grandfather. She remembered that they made eye contact at a dance in town, but that they didn't dare speak, and of course they didn't dance. They exchanged letters for months before they ever exchanged a word, but they eventually fell in love and they married. The second story was not romantic. Mama described people living in northern Mexico in the border towns that she grew up in, people that couldn't read and couldn't write. Instead of signing their full names, they had to sign documents by marking an X on paper. She described men coming in from working in the field with produce, standing in long lines, and drawing an X to indicate that they had been paid for their work, for the crops that they had harvested. The third story she repeated day after day, while she was holding my hand, was a story of her crying at home when she was a young girl because she couldn't go to school. When Mama was nine years old, her mother became ill, and she, the youngest daughter, had to quit school. She told me that she cried because she wanted to finish school, but bound by tradition in her mother's illness, she stayed home. This last memory in particular made her relive the long regret that she had never been able to become a teacher, never had the opportunity to teach others to write their own name or to read. Recalling these memories, she would pat my hand and whisper, Que triste, que triste. For her, teaching was a vocation. And she believed that through education, people can transform their lives. But more, she believed that through education, societies can be transformed. And when she had children that were growing up during the civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s in the United States, she supported their efforts to fight for social justice. She didn't discourage my mother from walking out of Uvalde High School in 1970, or my aunt, from running a newspaper that powerfully cr critiqued labor exploitation, segregation, disenfranchisement, discrimination. My mother and father walked out of their high school in protest of conditions that they suffered, including segregation, many years after Brown versus Board, and being denied the right to have access to bilingual education. 
But they were also walking out not only to change their conditions, but also for the generations that would follow, for me and for my sister, and so that we would have a chance one day to go to college. What my parents or my grandparents couldn't have known was that in 1968, there were students at Brown of the same generation that were also putting their scholarships and their grades and their college applications on, on the line when they walked out to demand change here at Brown. They could not have anticipated that, thou, that while they were in Uvalde fighting for equality in schools, that there were students here in Providence, Rhode Island, making sure that when I was ready to come to Brown U University, the university would be open to me too. Students in 68 and 75 and in the 80s and the 90s did important critical work, like establishing the Third World Center and the concentration in ethnic studies. These were life sources for me at Brown. My grandmother's stories and the history of student activism taught me a few things that I brought with me to Brown. The first thing that I learned from my grandmother's memories was that you have to surround yourself with love and laughter. These are the emotions that are not only key to building resiliency, but in the dark times, they bring us light. The second is that when you see injustice, you have to call it out. You have to be an agent of change. It's the injustice that we see that we aren't able to change that never leaves us. And second, what I learned from my parents and the stories of student activism that I learned about uh, growing up and then eventually here at Brown is that universities, schools of higher education are not utopian institutions. They too need reform. When students work for change, they are anticipating students that will come behind them. They are creating possibilities that others will be able to thrive because of their efforts. So I hope that's something that motivated me when I came to Brown, to figure out how I could be an agent of change when I was here, and it's something that I've carried with me as a faculty member. But in addition to what I, I brought with me to Brown, I hope that you'll remember the better world that you imagined while you were students here and the kinds of demands that you made in the turbulent years between 2014 and 2015. We need to remember the better world that you imagined now more than ever. We are living in a moment when civil and human rights are being pulled apart and stretched and are reaching a breaking point. And yet, we should have no illusions that the democracy that existed in October 6, 2016 was ideal or perfect. We are living then as we are living, we are living, we were living then as we are living now as people divided in drastically different worlds. In 2014 and 2015, black and Latinx children were shot and killed by police officers. Private prisons were holding immigrant children in detention. These detention centers were at capacity then as they are now. Undocumented students lived in fear then too. We know that the world that we inhabited then was not an ideal of full freedom. The institutions of our nation can be pulled until they crumble, although that's unlikely, I think. What is more likely is that they will be pulled apart, maybe only to snap back into the form, into the imperfect shape of democracy as it existed in October 2016. Or the institutions can be molded into something new. I hope we can strive for something new. I believe everyone in this room is capable of making that happen because you are able to make institutional change at a place like Brown, an elite private institution, a university that was made possible by the acquisition of land following a period of native genocide, a university that was made possible by dollars accumulated from the transatlantic slave trade. But thanks to you and the students that came before you, the Brown University that welcomed you through the Van Wickle Gates is not the same Brown University that is cheering your accomplishments today. So let's just think about some of the advances that you uh, helped to bring to campus just very quickly. That I've seen as I rejoined faculty, I feel like I'm graduating with you because I, I joined faculty in 2014. Brown University now celebrates Indigenous Peoples Day thanks to the contributions and the hard work of students, faculty, and staff at Brown. Students receive support from the First Generation College and Low Income Center, and the Fly Center also provides institutional support for undocumented students on campus. The services for students that need support for mental health are now greatly expanded to meet student need. The Title IX office is helping to find solutions for sexual assault and gender equity on campus. The university not only has a diversity and inclusion action plan, but academic departments and administrative departments have action plans of their own so that we can measure improvement. In spring 2019, students, faculty, and staff will celebrate the long contributions of pioneering African-American students at Brown when they walk by and spend time in the newly named Paige Robinson Hall. 
These institutional changes didn't come merely because progress comes naturally or with time. These changes that I've seen arrived because you helped inspire that change. Or we can be a little bit more honest and say, because you demanded the change. While you were at Brown, you helped organize critical conversations. You built coalitions across gender, race, class, religion, citizenship status. You wrote manifestos, organized demonstrations, and even occupied buildings. But students did more than just make demands. They answered an enormous call from President Paxson. On November 19, 2015, President Paxson invited members of the Brown community to contribute to the University Diversity, Diversity Inclusion and Action Plan. The university was open to honest assessment and asked for concrete actions that Brown needed to take to make it a more inclusive and diverse university. It was a daunting task, but it was an invitation and an opportunity. The changes that we see today resulted from students, faculty, staff, alumni, and the administration seizing that opportunity. In the midst of a long semester and over a holiday break, we made concrete recommendations. Students and faculty collaborated on Google Docs. Students had long work sessions. It was an enormous investment of our intellectual and economic, excuse me, intellectual and emotional energy. I know that I can read the DApp published in 2016 and see sentences that I drafted, included in that document, and now manifesting in change in campus. I see centers and programs that exist because of the recommendations of students sitting in this room, in these rows. As a historian, part of what I admired was that the students turned to the history of race at Brown to shape their recommendations. They were scholars in the study of how to make institutional change. They studied the history of the university and they studied the history of student movements and protests at Brown. And after reading the manifestos of students that came before them and earlier diversity and inclusion action plans, the students made concrete recommendations. We still have a long way to go before Brown University is the university that we dream it can be. We have an incredibly long way to go before we live in a world Regard, where regardless of citizenship, status, class, gender, sexuality, religion, or race, people can live in peace, surrounded by love and light, and not injustice. But what you helped to start here at Brown is nothing short of monumental. When we remember that this university is built on land that belonged to the Wabanong and Narragansett tribes, and that the university grew from families that profited from the transatlantic slave trade, when we remember that those are Brown's roots too, within that context, I hope you all can appreciate the truly remarkable contributions that you made for Brown. You continued the work of many that came before you and for the many that will follow you. So to conclude, let me quickly say that I hope that you remember what you were dreaming of before 2016. I hope that when you see injustice, you will call it out and be an agent of change. It's the injustice that we see that we aren't able to change that never leaves us. I hope that you will surround yourselves with love and laughter to stay resilient. And I hope that you'll find inspiration in what you've already accomplished here at Brown. When you see an opportunity to make change, take it, because they don't come often. Keep imagining and building a better world. I know that my grandmother, Mama Grande, would be so proud of you. And I know that I have been inspired by you. Felicidades y mil gracias. Congratulations and a million thanks. Thank you, Professor Martinez. Now I'd like to take a moment to welcome on stage Deans Shannon O'Neill and Christopher Dennis to help with the highlight of today's festivities. In a few moments, we will present to you the students who will be completing their degree requirements this month. Students, as Dean Dennis announces your name, please come forward on stage to receive a small memento of Brown. Uh, friends and families, we will kindly ask that you hold your applause until the last student has crossed the stage, please. <laughs> or if you do it, go really quick, okay? All right. 
Thank you, Dean Zia. To start us off with the mid-year presentations, um, I'd ask Atea Douglas and Alexandria Pimentel to start us off. Isabella Amron. <laughs> Joseph Bellavia. Maria Martinez. Asante Cruz. <laughs> Melissa Feynman. Ming Zhao Chen. <laughs> Melanie Ambler. <laughs> Emily Wicklund. <laughs> Edemir Castaño. <laughs> Rita Ding. Malcolm Drentel. Daniel Schreck. Lara Zeki. Joshua Green. Coco Nokajima. Angela Chung. Yeah. Rachel Gross. Yeah. Arthur Sun. Yeah. Marco Fejo. Congratulations. Kirby Engelman. Yeah. Rhea Stark. Pratik Joshi. Zoe Gates. Tate Puhala. Arohi Kapoor. Neville Dadina. Matthew Spiegel. Sammy Chomsky. Kelsey Fenn. Zoe Walganon. Charles Austin Deary. Anthony Cherry. Carrie Brooks. <laughs> Ann Beyer. <laughs> Michelle Bazile. <laughs> Sophie Urquhart. <laughs> Ruby Four. Eric Jara. <laughs> June G. Emma Galvin. Aaron West. <laughs> Tali Ginsberg. Natalie Lerner. Lauren Black. 
Ari Snyder. Mitchell Johnson. Pratul Tandon. Alexander Gaitis. Ian Stevenson. Elias Wardair. Jack Ross. Lindsay Sattler. Taylor Bright. Emma Wexler. Jacqueline Walsh. Nicole Nowak. Ann Hundert. Ricardo Aramillo. <laughs> Jokichi Matsubara. <laughs> Jamar Brown. <laughs> Your class of 2018.5. Congratulations again to the class of 2018.5. Bef Sorry. <laughs> Before we conclude, uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank our guitarist, Benjamin West, for the wonderful music. Uh, the Brown Chorus and their director, Fred Jodry. I really want to thank uh, Dean Shannon O'Neill, Wendy Sheridan from the college, Michelle Kellen, Kellen from University Events Coordina Coordination, who led and organized this celebration. Shannon, do you want to raise that up? Uh, please thank me in joining Professor Martinez, Dean Dennis, all the faculty and staff who have joined, your friends and families. We will conclude this this with the traditional singing of the alma mater. <laughs> after the alma mater, it's gonna get confusing. Okay, so after the alma mater, the students will process out of the hall. We'll ask everyone to remain standing until the processional is complete. And then we'll invite you to join us next door in sales hall, out the building and to the left for a reception hosted by the president. So now please rise for the alma mater. <laughs> alma mater, we hail thee with loyal devotion and bring to thine altar our offering of praise. Our hearts swell within us with joyful emotion as the name Pass me the shade of these time-honored walls, and sorrows as transient as April's brief showers. Have